Live from ClickOrlando.com, this is News 6 at 5.30. This is a News 6 Plus takeover. Here now is Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells with Talk to Tom. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Talk to Tom. I'm Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells. I love this show. It's my favorite show of the week. I do a lot of them. Um, we decided to come up with Talk to Tom back in the summer of 2004 during hurricane season with Hurricane Charlie. It was a chance for us to do social media before there was social media. It was a chance for you at home, the viewer, to ask anything you wanted to ask. We'd take calls live on the air and I would try to answer them, give you an idea of what I was thinking, what was going on, and give you the best answer possible. Since then, it kind of changed and grew up into something else we ended up doing. Talk to Tom during every hurricane season, every hurricane, we would do a call-in session and let you at home ask questions. Then I started doing it live on Facebook and from Facebook, it evolved back into hurricanes. And this past season, the general manager here at the Powerful KMG, Jeff Hoffman, loved it, thought it was great and decided it should fill in on Thursday afternoon and go live on New 6 Plus. And so that's what we do. Just send us your questions. We'd love to answer whatever it is you would like to know. Coming up a little bit later, we're going to be talking about that big bloom in the ocean, the sargassum, the stuff that's out there, the big weed that's growing, it's supposed to make landfall on our coast, imminent landfall, and perhaps even into the summertime. We'll talk to an expert about that. But right now, we want to get to your questions, and I begin with John Boss. John wants to ask, don't rubber tires shield you from the ground during a lightning storm? No, John John. <laughs> In a, in a nutshell, no, they do not. The, the tires are not thick enough, long enough, good enough to shield you from being struck by lightning. That's kind of a misnomer in that people think because um, if you touch an electric fence and there's no closed current sometime, you won't feel it running through you. But the truth is, rubber on the bottom of the car is not what protects you in a lightning storm if you're in a car. What protects you in a lightning storm if you're inside of like a big LTD or like my big Tom Mobile, my big SUV, is if a lightning strikes that, it runs through the shell of the car and goes right through the tires into the ground. Or sometimes in the bumper, it will leap right straight into the ground. And so it's not really the rubber on the bottom of the car that's protecting you in the lightning storm. Most of the time, or at least half of the time, when a car is struck and the lightning goes out through the wheels, it blows the tires out. Happens a lot. We've seen it happen on cop cars. We've seen it happen on passenger cars. We have video of it happening. Um, or I've seen video of things like that happening. There's also a misnomer in the same train of thought. Think about this. If, um, if it protected you, how could lightning strike you if you're wearing sneakers? I mean, you don't believe for one moment that a pair of Nikes is going to protect you from being struck by lightning. Please tell me you don't believe that because it simply isn't true. The step leader goes up, the lightning strike comes down, the exchange between the lightning bolt the cloud and the ground exchanges its charge and it runs right through you whether you're wearing sneakers boots barefoot or clogs crocs doesn't matter whatever you're wearing it will blow right through you so please know sneakers do not protect you in a lightning storm and the rubber on your car the tires do not protect you from being struck by lightning in a car it's the shell of the car that protects you all right next question up gene olivia Jean Olivia wants me to try to explain to her rain percentage. Her question is, how can I get a forecast for my area only? I have a lawn service, so we watch the weather closely. Sometimes you will say there's a 90% chance of rain, so we cancel the day's work and we don't get a drop of rain. Is there some way to pinpoint the weather to my location? Okay, Jean, first thing I can tell you is you need to rip out your phone, your smartphone right now, and you need to download the WKMG weather app. It's absolutely free and it's like having radar in your pocket in your pocket now you'll have radar you'll have an up-to-date forecast for your pinpoint zone and no matter where you are no matter what the rain chances are in central florida you'll be able to look at your phone figure out where you are you will be the little blue dot and the rain chances around you are your chances for rain there's also a future radar on there so it goes out a couple of hours to where you can see is it going to rain in the next two hours which would help you with your lawn service and help you with your pouring concrete if you're in construction or whatever it is you do for a living. Rain chances are, are a big topic of conversation. They blew up big time, bigly, as we say now in modern day vernacular, because of um, something that happened on TikTok. TikTok did it, someone went on TikTok and did a goofy, what are the rain chances? What do they mean? 
Um, the National Weather Service calls it POPs, probability of precipitation. And the rain chance that you're getting from me, when I say there's like a 30 or 40% chance of rain, is from my eight or nine county area in Central Florida. And I will say rain chances tomorrow are about 30% in Central Florida. Coverage is gonna cover this much of the market. I'll show the modeling. So what I mean by that is it's gonna rain in that area, probably over about 30% of the time area. So I use it more as a covered zone than just a chance you might see it. But if you live in that area, your rain chance of seeing that is about 30%. So probably a precipitation, probability of precipitation boils down to my confidence in the forecast and the area to be covered, okay? With a modern day model display that I have, that you'll see every evening on the powerful KMG during the weather, I'll show the hour by hour vi digital video display of where the rain is going to be. And so 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. or 7, whenever the rain's going to be there, I stop it there and go, look, here's 6 o'clock tomorrow, and you'll see how much rain there is in Central Florida. I'm putting rain chances at 30%, if 30% of the area is covered. So that's what we normally mean when we say rain chances are 30%. As far as it being too much for your uh, lawn service and not doing a good enough job in pinpointing you, I would suggest that you watch, pay very close attention to the probability of precipitation we talked about, the rain chance, and then look at that model display. But if you live like in Titusville versus Claremont, your chances of seeing rain on any given day are totally different. So there's a 30% chance of rain, but it's over Claremont. Well, Claremont's going to have a much higher chance of rain than Titusville. I'll still call that rain chances are 30%, even though it's confined mostly west. There you go. All right, Colleen Vickers. Let's talk about does the weather in the atmosphere cause the stars to look different in color, shape, and size? You bet. My sister and I sit outside every night, and we have noticed some stars that look like they have three stars wide. And those are gold in color. Some stars look like they twinkle. We joke that Big Brother's watching us and wonder if they are drones or weather balloons. They are not. Can you help us understand why stars look so different, color, shape, and move around? Absolutely. Here's the deal. Uh, stars twinkle because of the light is so weak and coming from such a great distance. It comes straight across empty space and then arrives in our atmosphere. So our atmosphere is full of all kinds of debris, moving air, moisture, and as it moves around, it kind of bends the light a little bit. And that's why things twinkle. If you are outside of our atmosphere and you get up to say the moon and you look up at the stars at night, they don't twinkle. They won't twinkle anymore. If you're on your way, say like in a uh, spacecraft, boom, you're blowing out of the solar system. You're looking at the little observation window, the dots way out there, they don't twinkle. One of the things people will always say is that you can tell it's a planet because it doesn't twinkle. That's not always true. Sometimes the planets will twinkle a little, but as a general rule, the planets are a little bit brighter and they don't get affected by the atmosphere as much. Like the moon, you stare at the moon. The moon has no discernible twinkle. It's so bright and so close that as it comes through the atmosphere, the light is able to penetrate more. So it reflects more of the sunlight, the sun's sunlight back at us and is brighter than like a star eons away. And so as the star's light, weaker light signal comes through our atmosphere, our atmosphere bends it, Makes for the twinkling. So there you go. That's what causes all of that. Okay. I think that's going to wrap it up. Nope. Is there one more? Yes. I have one more question to go to right now. And the question is, what causes a rainbow during a storm? Okay. That's very similar to the twinkling. It's the atmosphere. That, so water in the atmosphere. Normally you see the sunlight coming through moisture and it bends or refracts the light. There's a thing called a prism. And we always say, um, it's like shining a light through a prism, but I don't really understand how a prism works. Well, what it's doing is it's splintering the light and cutting it instead of it being one waveform, splices it into its different waveforms. And so the presence of all color is white, the absence of all color is black, and the rainbow is the division of the visible color. And that's what it is. It's the rainbow droplets in the rain behaving like a prism. And so that is what happens when we get a rainbow. All right. Thank you for your questions. I hope I answered them to your satisfaction. If not, ask again or ask something deeper. You know, if you want a follow-up question, you can always email me or you can send us your questions at clickorlando.com forward slash Tom to Tom. We would love to know what you want to know. Thank you for your questions. And remember to get on the conversation. Just do that. Stay with us now as we talk to a local expert about the giant, massive seaweed blob that is headed to Florida. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Talk to Tom. I'm Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells. I can't thank you enough for sticking around for this half of the show. I think you're really going to enjoy it. Now, earlier we did the answer the viewer question section. If you have a question that you want answered, always remember you can just send it in to me right here at clickorlando.com forward slash talk to Tom. We use your question online and on air on Thursday. So big, big story going on in weather, in science, in oceanography, and for Florida in general is the massive seaweed blob headed to Florida. Brian LaPointe is a researcher in seaweed at Florida Atlantic University. He's going to join us now to talk more about it. Welcome to Talk to Tom. Brian, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks, Tom, for having me today. All right. I, this is like a weird conversation we're going to have. Obviously, um, you're a doctor who studies seaweed. Most people wouldn't think that's a thing, but that's your entire specialty, right? That That's right, Tom. I, I got interested in seaweeds early on as a young boy, you know, hanging out on the beach in South Florida and, and used to, you know, see this sargassum seaweed coming in on the beach and I would shake it and all the all these beautiful life forms would fall out of it. Shrimp, crabs, uh, little nudibranchs, even seahorses, and really unique fish, uh, file fish, and of course the sargassum fish. So this is a really unique uh, algal community, the seaweed that floats on the surface and provides habitat for over a hundred species of fishes and invertebrates. Uh, so it's, it's actually something that's really good when it's offshore floating around. And even endangered uh, sea turtles uh, seek this out when they leave the beaches uh, as habitat. You see, people don't think about that. We think about, oh gosh, this is gross. What just rubbed on my leg? But it's actually part of the environment that we need, only this time it's kind of out of hand. How, how big is this blob? This blob that we've all been talking about that you, you announced, how big is this thing? Well, the, the area of the blob is what we call the, the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt, and it extends from the west coast of Africa all the way across the tropical Atlantic Ocean through the Caribbean and up into the Gulf of Mexico. So that's a, a large area, but where it is right now uh, is an area about 5,000 miles long by about 300 miles wide. And only a small fraction of that area uh, is actual sargassum floating on the, on the surface. But that amount of sargassum in that area is about 13 million tons. Wow, that's a lot. Now, now obviously, I do a lot of um, talking about climate change and about a warming environment. And people always say, can you positively prove to me this is human related? Sometimes we can. And sometimes we cannot. Why is this one so big? Did we cause that? Well, this is something I'm, I'm working on with a, a number of colleagues. Um, it's an interdisciplinary research effort. So right now, it looks like both potentially human and natural factors are involved here. Okay, let's talk about us. Honestly, if it stayed in the ocean forever, none of us would care. But this is forecast to come ashore largely in Florida, or at least partially in Florida. When do you think we're going to start seeing the big arrival? Well, we've already seen some of this arriving in Key West. Uh, Smathers Beach had quite a bit on it. And this is, again, part of our concern to see this much sargassum arriving this early in the sargassum season, which typically doesn't start until late April or May, and it peaks in July. But here we are already seeing it in places like Key West and in uh, Fort Lauderdale. Okay, well, let, let's make sure people understand this is not coming in like um, like a storm surge. It comes in like a big tidal wave all over the state of Florida. It's going to come in like bits and pieces, pockets, randomly. Am I correct? That's right. It, it's very hard to predict exactly where it's going to hit. Because again, there's a lot of variability. We've got the Florida current and the Gulf Stream carrying it north uh, up the east coast of Florida. But if the mm -hmm. wind is blowing out of the west, it's going to keep it offshore. Uh, if the wind is blowing out of the east or the southeast, then it's going to come ashore and 
you know, heavy, heavy winds are going to blow it that much faster and, and cause it to really pile up along the coast. So um, this is something, you know, we're predicting is going to be moving uh, in the coming months into the Florida area. It's, it's coming into the Caribbean right now uh, based on the satellite imagery. So we can expect to see more and more of it particularly places like Mexico, the Riviera Maya, they're already seeing pretty heavy inundations there at a number of beaches. But we're going to begin to see that level of inundation um, later this spring. Okay, so what kind of mess can we expect when it arrives? Obviously, it rots and we smell it and it becomes nasty. Well, you know, it all depends on how much comes on in the in the local factors also. For example, I know in Palm Beach last year at the north end of Palm Beach, there's a jetty there that was catching the sargassum. And once it got in there, it couldn't really get out and it just sat there and built up and decomposed. The water turned a dark brown that ran along the beach for quite some distance. Uh, and, you know, it, it wasn't very pleasant to, to swim in, I'm sure, for the local residents and tourists. And of course, it, it was releasing hydrogen sulfide gas and this this is a, a a toxic gas hydrogen sulfide that at high concentrations is a risk to human health particularly to those with respiratory issues um you know a study uh a couple of years back in 2018 in guadalupe and martinique reported that i think it was 11 or 12,000 people were diagnosed in clinics there for having acute exposure to hydrogen sulfide and wow. I'm, so it can really hurt you yeah so and i'm hearing now reports that pregnant women are particularly vulnerable to to the effects of hydrogen sulfide so it's just something to be um wary of and and know about and educate yourself uh you might not want to be in those areas breathing high concentrations of this stinky gas, this um, rotten egg odor, um, you know, when you're at the beach, uh, adjacent to some of these big piles of sargassum that are decomposing. Okay, Brian, one last question. I'll let you go. I'll let you get back. I know you're a busy, busy man. Everybody wants a piece of you right now because of this blob in, in the news that, newsmaker that it is. The immediate impacts, you can't stop it. How are we supposed to clean it up? What do we do? Yeah. Well, there are multiple impacts on the beach. You know, when you try to clean this up with heavy equipment, um, front end loaders and dump trucks, that, that's really harmful to these delicate beach communities and to the tourist industry as well. So, um, you know, that's, that's a real challenge. Uh, there are areas where they're putting booms out to try to hold it off the beach and then harvest it along the booms. But um, again, they're not having a lot of success with that. Another option that is actually being uh, looked at right now and, and tested in the Dominican Republic and Antigua is actually sinking it offshore before it oh, even wow. gets close to land. And what you do, basically, you you know you circle these large patches of sargassum with a net. You bring it up to a a, a big work boat and that you sink it with a pump down. Uh, to a point, a depth where the air bladders compress. And at that point, it becomes negatively buoyant and sinks oh. to the bottom of the ocean, you know, a th thousand meters or more down. And the good thing about this is that it not only can reduce the amount of sargassum coming out of the beach, but it locks away carbon fixed by the sargassum that can chip away at the CO2 buildup in the atmosphere. Wow. Something we call carbon sequestration so i, had I think that. that's it's great one of the more exciting things that's happening right now uh in the the sargassum blob world well on that high note we'll wrap this up because that's the best news i've heard related to the sargassum since we started talking about it that is brian lapointe from florida atlantic university brian thank you so much for being here i appreciate you being on talk to tom all my Have pleasure tom. thank you awesome and thank you at home for watching you can catch us every thursday between 5 30 and 6 right here on the powerful wkmg and we are always on news six plus i'll see you next week